Tesla CEO Elon Musk arriving in Beijing for an unexpected uh, meeting with uh, Premier Li Kang and Chinese officials removed restrictions on Tesla cars after the vehicles uh, did pass the country's data security requirements. And reports say Beijing has tentatively approved full uh, self-driving features. Joining us now with more on U.S.-China business relations, Leland Miller, China Beige Book. China had to sort of consider some, some different constituencies, I think, uh, Leland, right? I mean, they're making and pushing more cars being built over there than, than really need to be built to keep things chugging along. So helping a competitor, uh, and not a domestic competitor to that market, must have some other um, advantages for China. I think they're just trying to keep Elon in the game. Uh, you know, for 10 years or so, starting in 2009, Beijing created what was basically a protective cocoon around the EV industry. There was enormous consumer subsidies. There were no, a numer, uh, enormous producer subsidies. Uh, there was enormous protectionism. Uh, only Chinese cars, with a very few exceptions later on, uh, were subject to those subsidies. So you had this, this, this build-out, government-supported industry. Within 10 years, the, the industry became very impressive. It's very techn technologically innovative. Got these great cars, you know, and but you got too many, too many companies. You got too much production, and so they're all producing. They got a, a saturated domestic market. They need to go out. So you got a price war in China right now. Tesla's caught in the middle of that. So they, you know, t Tesla's got a, a a big job ahead of them. They're trying to get uh, not get caught in the crossfire. Right. So why would why would China want to help uh, keep you just said keep Tesla in the game? Why do they want to keep them in the game? Well, I think they, you know, they. Uh, you look at BYD, BYD, and others who are slashing prices uh, and are absolutely, uh, you know, have have no focus whatsoever on on profits right now. They're losing money per car in certain instances. You know, Tesla can't compete with this. So I think what they're essentially doing is not helping Tesla. They're making sure Tesla doesn't fade away into oblivion. You know, Tesla's got enormous challenges over there, as do all cars, even Chinese cars competing against each other. So I think right now this is about you know tweaking the regulatory uh, uh, situation, trying to keep Elon relatively happy, in, in, you know, amidst a price war that he can't be very happy about. So they need Elon. That, that, I guess that's my point. They need Elon and they need Tesla there because, you know, you keep saying keeping him in the game and making it easier for them. I don't know why they wouldn't want to crush Tesla and, and have world domination of the EV market. Well, they may be on their way to that, but I think you know some of the technology that Elon brings to the table is pretty impressive. That he's got self-driving, uh, you know, uh, autonomous vehicle uh, driving capabilities. They they want to put some new technology in the new Teslas there that are that'll make them somewhat autonomous. Uh, there is an upside for China to, to to keep Tesla in there, competing against these comp these uh, domestic companies. Uh, it creates for a more vibrant ecosystem. And now that Chinese companies have scaled up, they can they can compete very well. Uh, and so I think they're comfortable having Tesla compete right now. So there were some glimmers of hope for, for China's overall uh, economy, but April was not as good as March, was it? Are there now signs of, uh, uh, of, of emerging weakness, or is it three steps forward, two steps back? Well, what we always tell people is, is, is one month, which, you know, March is a good month, but one month is not a trend. And so we have to make sure we understand what's happening underneath the hood and, you know, in, in the spring before we decide that there's going to be some sort of Chinese economic recovery this year. You know, we were first out of the gate saying March was good, Q1 was going to beat expectations, but you're not seeing borrowing. As a matter of fact, the borrowing levels we're seeing right now on the corporate side are, are flat out scary. You're not seeing a jump in hiring. You're not seeing a jump in investment. You're not seeing a vibrant recovery. So, you know, there, there's, some, there's some positives underneath the hood. Properties looking better than last year because it was terrible last year. But it's just too early to think that we're in the middle of uh, any type of recovery. We, we have to be looking very closely at the credit data for April. And there's murmurs of a, of a yen devaluation, but that, that would be a major step that, that you don't think is in... They don't think it's in their interest to do that right now yeah, I, be destabilizing. I think this is a hilarious debate because on the one side, you have people who are China experts. On the other hand, you have people who do currency. And, you know, 12 of the last two currency devaluations are called by, you know, currency traders. So they're very excited about the possibility you could see sudden movement. 
the situation on the ground is not conducive to, you know, you do have, uh, you do have a, a soft peg of the yuan against the dollar. There has been pressure against it. You have a surging dollar. You have a lot of dynamics which are putting pressure on the currency. But a, a currency devaluation would be an enormous action. And I think people are looking at things like surging commodities inventories and a, you know, a, a, a divergence between the spot and the fix and saying, oh, China's ready to do something. This would be an extraordinarily bold thing to do, particularly in a presidential election year. I, I don't think they want that right now.